Okay, so I will kick off. Um, so welcome, uh, welcome to you all uh, for the, the fourth edition now of our with uh, Marjolaine Viret uh, Zoom in webinar on transnational sports law. Uh, we have again reached uh, quite a high number of registrations. We have a number of people watching directly on YouTube. So we want to, to thank you first for, for the steady interest. Uh, we also want to remind you that uh, if you're unable to attend or if you want to share the webinar, you can do so because the recording will be available on the YouTube uh, channel of the ASEAN Institute in a couple of days. Um, so today uh, we'll be talking about what is probably at this point um, the most famous, I would say, transnational sports law case uh, almost since uh, Bosman. Um, we are obviously talking about the Casta Semenya case. Um, we have decided to focus on, on two dimensions of the case. On the one hand, the, the ruling of the Swiss Federal Tribunal, which rejected Semenya's challenge against, against the Casa Ward and, and endorsed uh, the Casa Ward, which endorsed the, the uh, World Athletics eligibility rules uh, for athletes with differences of sex development, and we call them DSD regulation. And on the other, um, Casta Semenya's decision to lodge an application against Switzerland uh, with the European Code of Human Rights, and this is uh, a prospective uh, discussion, of, obviously, uh, on the basis of this ruling and its potential uh, implications for the case in particular, but also beyond that for transnational sports law and the role of human rights and of the European Court of Human Rights in this peculiar system, which is the Lex Sportiva. So as, as many or some of you at least will know, uh, the case raises a number of, of important questions from the point of view of transnational sports law, but also beyond. I mean, there are almost questions that, that reach to uh, philosophy, ethics, uh, legal theory to some extent. Um, and, and the first one I think that, that we will touch upon maybe would be less central than, than let's say if we would have discussed the, the CASA word is whether sports governing bodies should be allowed to define sports sex uh, distinguished from the legal sex. Um, let's say the sex as recognized by, by state administrations? And if yes, what type of criteria should be used to define the sports sex? And when are those criteria uh, those criteria adequate and proportional? Um, another question that I think is important and that we will touch upon also in the context there of, of the application to the European Code of Human Rights uh, is whether sports governing bodies should be allowed to require that athletes undergo certain medical procedures in order to participate in their competitions. Um, a third aspect that, that we will touch upon and that is more related to the Swiss Federal Tribunal's intervention in the case is what type of review should the Swiss Federal Tribunal exercise over CASA words? How much should this review be um, related to the human rights compatibility of the awards or end of and all of the underlying regulations of the sports governing body and in particular with regard to the european convention on human rights and finally a really i think crucial question and we are seeing a, a lot of movement over the last five years in this regard is the role of the european court of human rights and of the european convention in the context of transnational sports law um, is it becoming, in a way, the European Court of Human Rights slowly uh, the Supreme Court of World Sport and, in a way, replacing the CAS in this position? Uh, that is, I think, a question that is raised as well by this case. So, this is just a sample. You can come up, and I think our speakers will definitely come up with other different aspects to look into uh, to start tackling them. Uh, I think we have a great lineup today. Uh, starting with Professor Antonio Rigozzi, who is a professor for international arbitration and sports law at the University of Neuchâtel and a very well-known practicing lawyer in the field of transnational sports law, appearing both before the CAS and the Swiss Federal Tribunal. Uh, full disclosure, we are also co-editing together 
the Yearbook of International Sports Arbitration. Uh, Lena Holzer is a PhD researcher at the Graduate Institute of International Development Studies in Geneva, where she's uh, finalizing, I think, her thesis on the gender binary in international law. She's currently a visiting researcher at King's College London, and she lectured also at the Donau Universität on gender in sports and uh, wrote as well a, a critical post uh, commenting on the decision of the Swiss Federal Tribunal on the Opinio Juris blog, if you want to check it out. Uh, Michelle Kresch is a GSD student at NYU, uh, where she's finalizing her dissertation on normative continuity and change in global sport governance, the institutionalization of gender equality by world athletics. Uh, she recently published two articles, one on our sport, the fight for control of women's international athletics in the International Journal of the History of Sport, and to be a woman in the world of sport, global regulation of the gender binary in elite athletics in the Berkeley Journal of International Law. She was as well, and it's good, good to know it, uh, retained as a consultant by a council for Casta Semenia before the CAS. And finally, we have Professor Frédéric Bernard from the University of Geneva, who is a specialist in, in Swiss constitutional law and human rights law, to give us his perspective more on the role of the ECHR and the intersection between the ECHR and, and the Swiss Federal Tribunal. So let me start by giving the floor to, to Marjolaine, who uh, aims to provide a, a comprehensive and yet relatively short summary of the previous episodes of the Semenya saga. Uh, for a bit of background information, you should as well check out the, the commentary of Marjolaine, uh, by Marjolaine of the SFT, or the Swiss Federal Tri Tribunal decision that is available on the ASA International Sports Law blog. Uh, after Marjolaine's talk, we will turn to each of our invitees for 10 minute interventions. And then we will open the floor for a question from the audience. Um, which as usual, we will ask you to share via the chat function of the webinar. Marjolaine, the floor is now yours. Thanks a lot, Antoine. Uh, first, I'm also thrilled that we have brought this uh, panel here together today. Uh, and I'd like to start by giving some context, let's say for the presentations of our guests, let's say along the lines of how did we get here and, and where are we headed? So first, how we, did we get here? Uh, well, Castro Semenya's case was not the first case before CAS to deal with the regulations of the IAAF or no, now uh, World Athletics. Uh, so these regulations on uh, differences in sex de development, which we will call the DSD uh, regulations as, uh, as Antoine mentioned. Previously, these were referred to as hyperandrogenous regulations. And they first went to CAS through uh, sprinter UT Chan from India. And I'd like to note here that we are not in the related but still distinct area of regulation of participation of transgender athletes in, in sports. Um, so in this uh, UT Chan matter, the CAS panel rendered a preliminary award. Uh, as a result of which the regulations were temporarily suspended for two years and the IAAF, uh, now the World Athletics, was given time to conduct and present further studies, which they finally did after some uh, several extensions of, of the stay of the proceedings. When they finally did, they had also revised their regulations so that in the end, the categories of events that were covered by the regulations no longer affected duty churned, which resulted in her appeal being moot and, and the case being terminated. So how is that relevant to uh, Castro Semenea? Well, Castro Semenea uh, was under the hyperandrogenism regulation as other athletes indeed obliged to lower her testosterone levels. As a result of the CAS award in duty churn, uh, the athletes who were uh, affected by the regulations could drop the treatment and continue com competing without bothering about their testosterone levels. Now, when the World Athletics presented its new, its actual DSD regulations, uh, the regulations were limited in the scope to certain distances, so 400 meters to a, to a mile, 
they were limited to certain individuals that present certain characteristics that are defined as differences in sex development in the, in the regulations. Um, and, and that's also important, the testosterone level uh, had newly to be maintained below uh, five uh, nanomol per uh, liter. So it had been uh, taken down from, from 10, if I'm not mistaken. So at the same time, the scope of the regulations had become a uh, little bit narrower, but the requirements uh, for compliance had become uh, stricter. So seven year caster and uh, Athletic South Africa filed a request of arbitration to challenge the validity of this regulation. As you know, then the request was dismissed by CAS. It went to the Swiss Federal Tribunal, which also um, refused to set advice the, aside the award. And that is how uh, we end up here today. And the case is going to go to be presented to the, to the ECHR. Perhaps what I can add to the discussion before we go over to the speakers, uh, I'd like to highlight that obviously I think we all agree that it's it's a complex matter, but the the distinct the discussion is made more complex by the fact that there are two distinct levels of possible dissent. Uh, the first level is a factual one. So it's what is the current state of scientific knowledge regarding whether and to what extent athletes with DSD have an advantage over non-DSD female competitors, or at least an advantage in a way that it's of a magnitude that is comparable to male competitors, or what male competitors would enjoy if there were no division between male and female in, in athletics, which is also an issue that can be a, a, an issue of debate. So the case, ruled that there is such an advantage and that the advantage can be indeed expressed in branches of testosterone levels. The Swiss Federal Tribunal, and we'll see that with, with Antonio, formally could not look into this issue of fact. So its reasoning had to be based on the premise that the CAS award had set. And thus the, the Swiss Federal Tribunal also worked on the assumption that there were two groups of interest in conflict, so the protected class, what they call the class protégé of the female category, versus the, cl the class of the athletes with DSD, which is important for the argument of, uh, of discrimination. And well, I'd like to say that even though the Swiss Federal Tribunal cannot really review the finding of fact, if you read the decision between the lines, there are some indications within this decision that the judges probably endorse the CAS findings. There, there is an extract that I can quote that where they say that the statistics are particularly compelling in this respect, which is quite a strong uh, statement. Now those findings are controversial. So the quality of the evidence, the, the validity of the studies submitted by World Athletics and the interpretation they draw their from is disputed. But still that is the current state of things, let's say in terms of judiciary truth. So it's it's what we have today on the record. It's what the CAS found so that this advantage exists. And it remains to be seen, maybe we'll get some input from, uh, from Michel or Frederick on this, on whether the ACHR will accept to go to some extent into the assessment of the evidence around this. That's, that's the first level. The second level is, um, is a debate of arbitrating between values. When speaking in a, in a judicial context, we're going to, to speak of arbitrating between conflicting rights and weighing interests. And so it's an issue of law. And also, but because we have a, the, the, the matter leaves a lot of latitude to the judge to weigh those interests, in the end, it's, it's a form of policy choice um, which will favor certain values over others. So for example, if we cannot really tell whether DSD uh, athletes are at an advantage or not, do we value inclusiveness of athletes with DSD more or the idea, for example, of protecting winning opportunities for female athletes without DSD? And the CAS here, the CAS arbitrated in the sense that the regulatory measures taken by the IWAF, of course, always according to the state of science that the CAS had found to be established, but that these measures were legitimate and proportionate, and so not an unlawful discrimination. 
and uh, the Swiss Federal Tribunal found that this assessment was at least not contrary to uh, public policy. So obviously the two levels I just mentioned flow into each other, but I, I still think it's important to have this distinction in mind. And it's also important to note that it was never really in dispute that there is a discrimination based on, I'm putting into brackets, based on sex or gender or what the different legal frameworks that are involved may, may call it. Uh, so we are in a context of deciding whether a discrimination based on sex can be justified. And this is important because the burden of proof is on the sports governing bodies in this respect. So if the state of science is inconclusive as to the presence of, uh, of an advantage that justifies intervention, uh, the discrimination cannot be justified and the regulations must fall. But I still think it's not appropriate to completely disregard the presence of the two levels, even, even if the balance of interest uh, and the discrimination fall flows into, well, needs the, the factual assessment as an underlying finding. And I, I, was, uh, I was struck by uh, a letter that was wrote, written to uh, Sebastian Co by uh, uh, some experts uh, related to the Human Rights Council, um, where they state as, as something that is really obvious, and I quote, um, moreover, scientific concerns cannot take precedence over concerns about enjoyment of human rights or human rights violations. And they state this, this as something obvious, but in reality creates a form of straw man argument because it's, it's not a debate about whether there is an opposition between science and human rights such that one would somehow trump uh, the other. It's, it, it's a question of weighing the elements so that the science is part of the elements that are needed to decide whether the difference in treatment is justifiable or not. So in order to make, so to say, a, an informed value choice or an, an informed balance of interest, and, and, and science will never, it's not, it's never going to tell you anything about rights, it's not going to tell you whether uh, an advantage is relevant to make a distinction or not. But it's, it's important, uh, and we'll see that uh, in the, maybe in the input uh, given by the speaker, it's important to, to frame this as a dispute, in my view, between science and human rights, because otherwise there is no dialogue is, is possible at all. So that's just to give some input for framing the discussion on, on the merits. Just a few words uh, on the legal avenues to, to transition into then Antonio's and then uh, Lena's uh, presentation. In addition to these complex issues on the merits, we have the issue of the legal avenues that uh, Antoine mentioned. So I don't want to repeat what, uh, what Antoine said, but uh, Antonio is going to discuss the grounds available against the arbitral award. And I was also consulted on issues of sports arbitration in, in connection with the application to set aside the, the, the award in front of the Swiss Federal Tribunal. So I'm, I'm not going to comment too extensively on this, but what I think is uncontroversial is the fact that invoking human rights in the context of sports regulations requires overcoming several hurdles and in particular, the status of sports organizations as private entities operating on a private law basis. So that, that is going to be also probably part of the, of the discussion today, knowing that there are private counterparts. And in fact, both the CAS panel and the Swiss Federal Tribunal did carry out a test of whether the measure were uh, such as to justify a discrimination. And then finally, and, and then I'll hand over to Antonio, in the case of uh, Castor Semenea, there were additional case-specific hurdles, such as, for example, the seat of the sports governing body that was not in, in, in Switzerland. Um, so I think that's enough uh, from me. And so I'll hand over, I believe, first to Antonio and then to Lena, who are both going to address the Swiss Federal Tribunal decision. Thank you, Marjolaine. <laughs> asking me to go first, which is not very polite to Lena. But uh, the good news, Lena, is that I will be 
very short. And the reason is that you have people on this panel who were directly involved in this case, so they have first and uh, knowledge. What I can give you is more of a, let's say, high level view of the of the legal situation, uh, precisely from the perspective of what Marjolaine has called the, the, the legal avenues. If I look back at this entire story, but not only to this, at this story, but more general in cases where uh, human rights were at stake in, in sport, uh, there is the, 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 the following paradox. Your day in court is at CAS. That's your day in court. The reality is that at CAS, with some minor decision, uh, you can argue human rights, but if you uh, examine carefully the way in which they are discussed, assessed, it is still a little bit uh, disappointing, I think, for the experts in, in human rights. Um, the case that we are discussing here today is probably an exception, and this is due obviously to the nature of the case. There is something profoundly human here that really goes to the essence of, of the person, but I think it's in terms of depth of the analysis, it's an exception. Um, for me, it was pretty much revealing of the general attitude of CAS when it comes to arguments based on, on human rights was the, the recent Rosada versus WADA decision. Uh, if you read the summary of the party's position, you will see that there were plenty of argument based on, on, on human rights, on your human rights uh, fundamental guarantee. There were experts very high level experts on both sides explaining why uh, this guarantee should apply or not and so on and so on. Uh, when you come to the part of the award devoted to the analysis, you will see that it's, uh, it's very uh, disappointing. Basically, they tried uh, as hard as they could uh, not to go into, into that issue. So where you really have your day in court, where it makes a difference, where if you win, you really change your situation. The reality is that uh, those arguments are not. Uh, and of course, I'm, I'm, I'm summarizing, and, but I'm not taking seriously. And if you look at Article 6, so the, the procedural guarantees, you will if you go back to the CAS awards 10 years ago, even five years ago, you will see that they were not, they were discarded in two lines. Then it took Pechstein, and now, of course, they are taken seriously. You mentioned six, uh, uh, Article 6 in a submission. You can be sure that you get the panel, uh, the panel attention. We are not here yet with respect to the substantive, so the substantive uh, guarantees. Um, and that's the, uh, I said that it's a bit the paradox where you have your, uh, your day in court, it will not, you will not have a real discussion. You will have then uh, a second chance at the level of the Swiss Federal uh, Tribunal, but there for reason that I will explain in a while, you will see that it's not really a day in court. It's just a, a, a chance to point out that something went really wrong. So the, the scope of the examination is significantly, significantly uh, limited. And then you will have what I think will be a second real day in court, at least if I look at how uh, the Bechstein court looked at the issue, that is in Strasbourg. Uh, of course, the difficulty of this is that it will take, if we apply the, the, uh, the Bechstein standards, nine years to get a decision. So I hope for, for the athlete here that she will have a decision uh, before nine years, but even if it's four years, I am not sure that she will be uh, as competitive as, as uh, she was a couple of years ago by the time she receives the, the decision. So, and again, it remains to be seen whether uh, she will have the kind of thorough approach that Pechstein and Muto got or whether she will get the kind of dismissive approach that, for instance, Platini had in, uh, in, his, uh, in his challenge. So 
this is for the for the big picture and i don't want to to speak about things uh, that will be discussed later so let's focus a little bit on this uh, intermediary stage uh, that it's the swiss federal tribunal and to me one of the reason why uh, human rights arguments are not treated that seriously at CAS, it's also because CAS arbitrators know that the risk of having the award set aside on that basis by the Swiss Federal Tribunal is very limited. Now, of course, this should not be the guiding principle, right? You are, as an arbitrator, you are not there to render an award that it's, I mean, the standard should not be the award is not sufficiently bad to be set aside by the, by the Swiss Supreme Court. The standard should be the award should be good, just, and, and fair. But still, uh, you all have been arbitrators. It's clear that when there is this sanction of the setting aside, of course, you pay more attention to that, to, to, those, uh, to those aspects. So it's something to, to, to keep in mind. The day the award, uh, the day the Swiss Supreme Court will set aside an award based on human rights, you will be sure that when you run that same argument in front of another CAS award, you will have the full attention of the, the full attention of the tribunal. Now, what are the chances that this happened? Uh, reading the, the decision that we are discussing here today, I would say very low. Very low for two reasons. Uh, first, there is this uh, approach by the Swiss Supreme Court about horizontal effect of, of, of human rights that is much stricter than what the European Court of Human Rights uh, applies. So the standard is, is stricter, which means that when you're in Lausanne, it's already a uphill battle. You will have to start uh, by, by reversing the, this uh, difficulty. Then when it gets to the merit, you have other hurdles. You have You have to know that the only ground to set aside an award on the merits is public policy. Now, after after Pechstein, everybody thought, oh, you know what? Uh, Article 6 and the European Convention on Human Rights will be inevitably a, a ground to set aside the award because if it's not complied with, then Switzerland will be sanctioned uh, later on in, in, uh, in Strasbourg. Uh, that's not that's not the approach of the Swiss Supreme Court. You will still have to show how exactly the guarantee that you are relying upon, taken from the European Court of Human Rights, in the context can qualify as a matter of public policy. Yet an additional yet an additional hurdle. Um, to me, there is also a silver lining here, right? Uh, because it allows, and I don't know whether somebody has run that argument, but you can say, okay, Supreme Court, you are distinguishing European Convention on Human Rights on the one side and public policy on the other side. What I'm telling you is that you have to take the substance of the guarantee, forget about the fact that it's simply private in nature, and since the question is, it's against public policy, yes or not, it doesn't make a difference whether the body that decided uh, or took the decision is a private body or a public body. So you can turn that, uh, use the concept of public policy, which does not distinguish between private and public to overcome the hurdle of the uh, horizontal effect. This is what I would plead if I had to, to go there. Uh, not sure whether it works or not, but I think there is something there to, to, to be explored. Apart from that, it's clear that uh, if I summarize, because I realize that I'm, that I'm, that I'm slow, uh, it will inevitably boil down to a kind of proportionality test, uh, one way or another. Huh? You call it proportionality test, you call it a balance of interest. That's what will apply uh, when it comes to, to public policy. And as Marjolaine said, of course, since the Swiss Supreme Court will not be in a position to review the facts, 
if the class arbitrators are smart enough to have a strong uh, factual uh, uh, section in the award where they where they ascertain the facts that allows them to build on the reasoning the chances of success of the supreme court are uh, if you ask me very 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 limited uh, marshall had mentioned it remains to be seen if the european court of human rights is prepared to some extent reconsiders the fact i think that this is possible uh, reading reading for instance platini uh, it's clear that there is a, a proportionality test that it's broader than what is applied at the level of the Supreme Court. And it's it goes back to, I have a couple of quotes here, arbitrariness, unreasonable, blatantly inconsistent. They will look at the situation as a whole. They will look at the system. They will look at what happened at CAS plus the Swiss Supreme Court, look at the outcome and see whether it's unreasonable. So I wouldn't rule out that the third day in court would be once again a real a real date in court, with the difference that, of course, it will more often than not be be too late. But it's worth exploring that path because I'm sure that when we will have a let's say a Pechstein two, the first case concerning uh, substantive guarantees, then it will be taken seriously down at the CAS level when you can make a, a difference. Thank you. So that's what I wanted to, to, to say from the bottom of, yeah, whatever. Thanks. And, and now we turn to, to Lena, uh, to also for another perspective um, on, on, on the decision of the Swiss Federal Tribunal. Lena, the floor is yours. Yeah, so thanks a lot also. Thanks a lot for giving me the floor and for inviting me today here. And thanks also to Maya Line and Antonio for having already cleared the floor for me. So I will specifically look at this decision by the Swiss Federal Tribunal and take a bit of a critical analysis on it um, and look specifically at some human rights and gender justice implications of the decision. And so while I really realize that the tribunal has been very restricted in the possibility to review the CAS award, I think there are certain points of the decision which are worth analyzing because they can tell us a bit more about the issues at play in the CAS, CASAS in any case. Um, so I will focus on two main points. Um, one point is the way how the SFT approached the prohibition of discrimination as part of the notion of public policy. And then the second point is how it took into account general like power imbalances in current international sports governance. So one major claim by Casta Semenya was that next to constituting a violation of her dignity and some personality rights, the caste award also violates uh, the prohibition of discrimination as being part of the notion of public policy. And as we heard, the, the SFT can't revisit or rectify the reasoning on discrimination put forward by the caste or can revisit the, the evidence put forward. Um, but it can and must undertake its own analysis whether the effects of the CAS award are contrary to the prohibition of discrimination as encompassed in, in the notion of public policy. And in this analysis, um, the SFT relied very much on the reasoning put forward by the CAS on whether the DSD regulations are necessary, proportionate and reasonable. So in this way, I think it refers to what Antonio just said, that the CAS had put forward a very strong factual analysis, and that made it easy also for the SFT to rely on that for its own analysis. Um, plus, in this analysis also on the discrimination, on the prohibition of discrimination, the SFT also brought up an own analysis on the concept of fairness. And also, as my line in her article on the block, on the ASA block, mentions, it kind of makes this a bit troubling parallel between the anti-doping regime and a specific case in that and the DSD regulations. And in fact, the SFT decision draws this analogy between the DSD regulations and the anti-doping regime at several instances. And one is this case where it brings up the case of the FNASS and others versus France at the European Court of Human Rights in order to argue that certain restrictions and the right to private life, such as through doping controls or the DSD regulations can be justified in order to ensure the objective of fairness in sports. 
Um, and this analogy between anti-doping rules and the DSD regulations comes also up somewhere else. For example, when the SFT discusses uh, Semenya's claims that the DSD, regulation, DSD regulations constitute violations of her right to physical and mental integrity because she must undergo humiliating and intrusive medical examinations to determine whether her body is sensitive to testosterone. And in this analysis, the SFT held that the interference into the bodily integrity of the athletes concerned is not so significant because the bodies of athletes are generally already subjected to scrutiny um, through anti-doping tests. Um, but I, I think this comparison between the medical examinations undertaken in the DST regime um, versus the those undertaken for doping tests um, is a bit unsuitable because the medical examinations undertaken under the DSD regimes really are very intrusive um, examinations of sex characteristics of the women and also involve like quite personal questions. Um, and I think this can't be compared to the general doping tests. And I think it's also unfortunate to connect these two issues of doping and the DSD regulation because it kind of reinforces this perception that the women who are affected by the DSD regulation have kind of done something wrong or like cheated. Um, and maybe at this moment, I also want to bring up the question of what fairness in sports actually is. Um, are we talking about equality of opportunity or equality of condition or equality of outcome? And, and why is testosterone in this discussion more relevant than other factors, such as other genetic factors or socioeconomic factors? And these are questions which are brought up in the Castus in many cases, which are highlighted, and I think they're very important. And I will bracket them for the moment because I will continue with a more specific analysis of the SFT decision. So another point regarding the prohibition of discrimination, which was brought up, is its relationship to horizontal discrimination, as Antonio already mentioned. And um, the SFT decision also kind of copies um, a passage from the order by the president of the SFT to lift the super provisional order in, from July 2019. And it is like order from 2019. Um, the, the president of the SFT held that it's doubtful whether the prohibition of discrimination, as included in the notion of public order, encompasses also horizontal discrimination. So the discrimination between like two private actors or several private actors. And then the SFT continues to, to discuss the jurisprudence related to Swiss constitutional law and in fact, in, that it in fact only covers vertical discrimination. But then it also continues to discuss the fact that there's kind of this relationship between international sports federations and athletes, which is similar to kind of a state and an individual, because after all international sports governance is very hierarchical and the relations are actually after all very much determined on a vertical axis. But then the, the, the court leaves the discussion there and doesn't really conclude in it. Um, and continues to argue that the DSD regulations are anyway not discriminatory. But I think it's important, I want to pick up this discussion on horizontal discrimination because it's important and it tells us something else about like international sports governance generally and also the sex verification policies specifically. Because also feminists have been really at the forefront for arguing that horizontal discrimination must be part of the general prohibition of discrimination precisely because women and also other oppressed and marginalized groups experience most of their experiences of discrimination in their relationships with private actors and not so much in the relationships to states. And so violence against women is now considered as part of the prohibition of discrimination in international law, such as considered by the CEDAW committee. Um, and violence against women is mostly experienced actually in the relationship with private actors. And um, similarly, also intersex persons often face discrimination and violence in so-called like the private sphere. So intersex persons have innate sex characteristics that don't fit the medical norms of female and male bodies, such as the women affected by the DSD regulations. And intersex persons commonly make experiences of bodily violence, especially also during childhood, um, because many of those, and that also depends on the region where, where intersex persons grow up, are subjected to harmful medical treatment um, in order to align their bodies with normative standards of female and male sex. And this, and this, also these medical treatments are now more and more considered as human rights violations by international human rights bodies. But again, here, these medical treatments are mainly undertaken 
like so-called like private actors such as doctors and it's mainly parents who decide on that. So again, if the if horizontal discrimination or horizontal human rights protection doesn't kick in, it marginalizes a certain particular group, especially. So I think from a gender and human rights perspective, it's really unfortunate that the SFT does not assign the same legal stand status to horizontal discrimination as to vertical uh, discrimination. Um, since also this um, affects certain gendered groups such as intersex women more than others. And I think it's also unfortunate because there have been a lot of um, efforts to include the concept of due diligence really in the framework of business and human rights um, in international law and the guiding principles are also very strong on that. Um, yeah. So let me like move on to the second point I want to discuss, which is how the SFT has recognized certain power imbalances in its decision. And I think for the um, purpose of time, I will only focus on one example. So I will discuss kind of how the SFT has approached the issue of consent. Um, because it discussed whether taking contraceptives as a means to lower the testosterone to be able to participate in the restricted events can be considered as being kind of similar to forced medical treatment. And the decision seems to imply that there's a clear difference between forced medical treatment and the situation that an athlete decides, even very reluctantly, to undertake common treatment just in order to comply with the DST regulations in order to be able to continue competing in her events. Um, and then the SFT decision also goes on to argue that even if undertaking of, the, of hormone treatment without free consent by an athlete can lead to the infringement of this athlete's um, physical integrity, it says that there could be predominant public interests and the rights of third parties that it can justify this infringement into the right to bodily integrity of the athlete. So I'm personally wondering what these predominant public interests for undertaking of hormone treatment without free consent of the athletes are. Um, how can interest of the public override the right to free consent with regards to hormone treatment of the athletes? So I'm wondering about this public interest. And also from a feminist point of view, um, the discussion could have problematized this issue of consent a bit more. Because femin a lot of feminist legal scholars have argued that autonomy should be more understood as a relational approach, like as a relational concept, because there are multiple constraints and multiple influences influence our decisions. And in the context of the DSD regulations, there are obviously economic constraints, um, which influence the men in the decision in order to undertake or not to undertake hormone treatment. And in another passage, the SFT also kind of downplays these economic dependencies of, um, of athletes on, on their career, on being able to compete in their events, by, for example, saying that athletes seem to do their sports or want to compete mainly for personal satisfaction or for gaining fame. And I think that kind of ignores also the economic hardship that, that women have like experience when they can't compete in the in the events anymore, and also the whole economic hardships that their families sometimes experience, especially athletes from the global south. Um, at the same time, also another constraint I think which should be taken into account is the high stigmatization of being intersex or having sex characteristics that do not conform to normative standards. Um, because one kind of side effect of this of these regulations is also that some um, athletes are forcibly outed especially if they don't undertake hormone treatment and they don't participate in world athletic events, because then the public will start to, to question, okay, like they would, they would qualify, but then they don't, don't participate at an international level. So I think, I think taking into account these economic constraints and also the high stigmatization of intersex persons would have like led to a bit nuanced understanding of the issue of consent in the case. Um, yeah, so, so generally, I think that the, the case highlights a few power imbalances in international sports governance and also issues related to gender justice, but also issues related to human rights um, and the access to justice more broadly. But I, I will stop here and just give the floor to Michelle and look forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lina. Um, and now we will turn to, to Michelle. And Michelle, also, I forgot to mention, you just published on, on the Volker, Volkerrechts blog uh, a blog on sports sex before the, the European Court of Human Rights, which will probably uh, overlap to some extent with, with your presentation. So for those uh, listening in or watching in, this could be a good reference to check. And I think I want to 
connected to some extent also your presentation with, with Lena's um, remarks also on the point of the analogy between TSD and doping, because I think this analogy will play a crucial, crucial role before the European Code of Human Rights because of the FNRA double S uh, case that, that will play a role as a precedent to discuss uh, when, when is, is fairness in sport really at play. And, and now I give you the floor to discuss that in, in much more details. Thanks, Antoine. And yes, I will try to sort of comment on that perhaps misplaced analogy. Um, so yes, uh, as we know, Castro Semenya has lodged an application with the European Court of Human Rights. And although this is now sort of her third legal claim coming after the decisions of um, the Court of Arbitration for Sport and then the Swiss Federal Tribunal, I think uh, both Lena and Antonio have sort of set us up very well to see that this will actually be the first time that any court or tribunal applies international human rights law directly to the dispute. Um, the, the first time any court evaluates the private regulations of world athletics uh, and particularly the role of Switzerland in upholding them directly against human rights law. Um, and it may also mark the first time that the ECHR decides a case of discrimination based on sex characteristics. The court has yet to do so. So I think we can be sure that some of the questions before the ECHR in Semenya's case will be new and different or at least somewhat um, reoriented compared to the questions on which the case has turned so far um, and also different from questions the ECHR itself has addressed before. So I'm just going to sort of canvas a few of these questions. Um, now, we don't know exactly which provisions of the European Convention Semenya has invoked or will invoke, but we can probably safely speculate that at least Article 8, the right to respect for private life, and, and Article 14, the prohibition on discrimination, will be relevant. So um, let me just start with Article 8, which encompasses uh, the right to, to personal autonomy and identity, including physical, psychological, and moral integrity. Without going into detail, I, I think it's quite clear that the regulations, which as has been mentioned, sort of involve coerced medically unnecessary interventions on athletes' bodies touch upon this right as it, it's usually interpreted by the court. Um, now, right off the bat, this case is an interesting one because according to Article 8, any infringement must be in accordance with the law. In other words, um, it must have some basis in domestic law. Interestingly, though, the, the regulations at issue in Semenya's case are, are not codified in any Swiss legislation or, or based on any international treaty like, say, anti-doping rules in sport. So Switzerland is going to be in this somewhat strange position of defending regulations that it actually had nothing to do with, at least not until the Swiss court sort of upheld those regulations. So Switzerland will have to establish that these regulations enacted by a private association in Monaco pursue one of the you know, legitimate aims that are identified in the European conventions, in the European convention, sorry, such as um, you know, the protection of morals or the protection of the rights and freedoms of others. Um, in the context of an anti-doping case, the, the ECHR has recognized that sort of fair play and, and equality of opportunity in sport constitutes such an aim. So Switzerland will you know, then have to go on to establish that the regulations are necessary to achieve this aim, or uh, in other words, that they, they serve a, a pressing social need. So to give an example from sport, um, the court has held that anti-doping whereabouts rules serve a pressing social need. And that's because of all the evidence that you know, doping harms the physical and mental health of athletes and, and sets a dangerous uh, example for youth. But in Semenya's case, the, the, the quote, danger that Switzerland is seeking to avoid or, or is allowing world athletics to avoid um, is much less apparent, I think. One could say, and I guess I have said that it's, it's Semenya and other athletes targeted by the regulations, um, as well as any youth that are looking up to them that are actually put most at risk. Um, in any case, the ECHR practices to you know, balance individual interests and the, the interests of the community as a whole. Um, now here, I think the critical question will be who makes up the relevant community? 
So is it, you know, Swiss athletes or the Swiss public as a whole? Is it athletes all around the world or, you know, the, the entire international public? Basically, because, you know, sport is this, this hugely visible social practice, not just done, but consumed by so many people around the world. It will be very important you know, which community or communities are counted and, and valued in the court's assessment. Um, if, if we look back to the cast decision, for example, the majority specifically said they, they could only consider the impact of the regulations on the segment of society governed by world athletics. And I, I think the Swiss court seems to have taken a similar approach. But it, it, it's not just you know, elite women athletes without intersex traits who comprise the community with interests at stake. Uh, and actually not much evidence has been collected to sort of characterize what these interests are. Um, in any case, the regulations have significant impacts far beyond sport, I would say. So you know, not just for the whole of Semenya's life, but also for say, the, the LGBTI plus community as a whole, which might have an interest in avoiding the stigmatization that flows from compulsory normalization procedures uh, in any sphere of life. Perhaps also for sports fans who might have an interest in seeing the, the unhindered potential of, of every athlete on display. And I think the list goes on. So I think we should pay close attention to, you know, what impacts and, and which communities the ECHR acknowledges and, and prioritizes in its assessment. And I, I also want to highlight that the, the scope of the relevant community will be very important to determining whether there is a relevant European consensus or, or common approach, which uh, in turn informs how great uh, a margin of appreciation or, or degree of deference is to be granted to Switzerland here. So. I mean, on one hand, I wonder if there is uh, a European consensus developing on the issue of sex normalizing interventions because uh, the Council of Europe's Commissioner for Human Rights and Parliamentary Assembly have both called on states to end such interventions without free and, and fully informed consent. Uh, on the other hand, however, when it comes to sport eligibility rules, it could be said that the common European approach is simply to defer to private international governing bodies like World Athletics, whatever they're doing. Um, but I would suggest that any such, uh, I guess what I would call consensus by emission really only highlights the, the sort of structural failure of states to uphold proactively where, where necessary human rights uh, in the context of sport. And, and to take the point uh, a bit further, World Athletics regulations essentially prevent any consensus or lack of consensus from emerging among states because you know, they pressure states to, to defer or, or to comply with what sport governing bodies decide or, or risk being barred from international competitions. And they restrict athletes access to domestic courts. Um, so I guess in other words, the, the way the international sports system is set up seriously disincentivizes states from developing their own approaches even when, as we see in this case, fundamental human rights uh, are at stake. So I think it will be crucial whether the ECHR views Switzerland, which is you know, the home of, of the CAS and the Swiss Federal Tribunal, which has exclusive jurisdiction to review CAS awards, um, as, as having a unique and a heightened responsibility to secure the human rights of athletes throughout Europe and effectively throughout the world. Um, or to put it another way, because Switzerland is a, you know, effectively placed to speak for a worldwide community, perhaps its, its margin of appreciation should be very narrow. You know, if, if, if you're deciding for all of us, then, then you don't get much policy leeway. Um, I suspect you know, Antoine and maybe others might have more to say on this point, but let me just uh, say something very briefly about Article 14 of the convention and, and the scientific evidence in this case before I finish. So Article 14, which uh, guarantees non-discrimination in the enjoyment of other substantive convention rights would, would certainly seem to apply in this case uh, because the regulations target only athletes with certain so-called differences of sex development. They, they do not apply to everyone seeking to compete in athletics or everyone seeking to compete in women's athletics. Um, now, I don't think it's that the test for discrimination that will be used by the ECHR, you know, is that different from the one used by 
the Swiss court and, and the CAS. Um, you know, it's the usual test common across many jurisdictions of you know, whether there has been differential treatment and if so, whether it can be justified sort of the proportionality question that Antonio was mentioned earlier. Um, but as we saw in both the CAS and uh, SFT decisions, this is sort of where disputes about facts and evidence, including scientific evidence, are most acute. Um, and while the, while the Swiss court found itself you know, bound to accept the, the factual findings of the CAS, the ECHR can reassess the evidence and, and can request additional evidence or, or, or draw inferences from the absence of evidence. Um, if there's you know, uncertainty, and I think there's a great deal in this case, the court, the court can rely on evidence from a wide range of external actors, experts, third party interveners, um, scientists, sure, especially because the scientific evidence is uh, very contested in this case. Um, but I, I agree with Lita, and I think also what maybe Marjolaine was getting at that, you know, a, a full review of the evidence will probably reveal that to the ECHR that, you know, uh, biological science itself cannot really provide a definitive answer to the question here. Um, I think most of us would agree, you know, that fairness is not purely a question of science. So, um, of course, the ECHR will not only consider discrimination, but also substantive, other substantive human rights in a more direct and uh, in-depth way than we've seen in the sort of judicial processes Semenya has pursued to date. And uh, yeah, we'll see whether this changes World Athletics assertion that the CAS itself is competent to ro uh, rule on human rights claims or um, the way that the, the Swiss Federal Tribunal considers human rights law when it's defining public policy. Um, but uh, yeah, like I said in, in the recent blog post that uh, Antoine mentioned, the, the ECHR's decision in this case, what, however it comes out, I mean, is sure to have implications far beyond Switzerland uh, and far beyond the sports, sports sphere. So I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, Michel. Um, and now we, we turn to, to Frédéric, Frédéric Bernard, uh, for a final uh, take, and again focused on the role of the European Court of, of Human Rights, as from now, um, maybe also uh, explaining a little bit the procedure ahead, but as well the potential consequences of, let's say, a, a negative decision for Switzerland uh, back to uh, the Swiss Federal Tour. Um, Frédéric, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for this very, very kind invitation. So yes, I've been asked to provide a few, uh, maybe procedural information on, on what is going to happen. Um, to go back to what Antonio was saying at the beginning, it, there seems to be a tendency now to see more high profile cases regarding arbitration in, in, in sports coming um, to the European Court of Human Rights and the court surely seems to, to become the, the, the um, most uh, uh, the preferred forum to, to deal with uh, human rights issues. Um, the Mutu and Pashtan case was mentioned from 2018. Of course, the Platini decision, I will come back to it in, in a few minutes from, from last year. Um, and now, of course, the Semenya application. Um, I think the first question we should, and the first thing we should be we should be careful about is the question of the admissibility of the application. Um, you know that there are very, there are some formal criteria enunciated in the convention itself. For instance, um, before lodging an application, you have to exhaust all available domestic remedies, which are not many in, in, in cases of arbitration in Switzerland, of course. But you have to reach you have to reach the summits of the national jurisdictional order before you can lodge an application. Then after the final the, the final national decision, you have six months to, to lodge your application. From what I've seen, uh, Semenya tweeted on February the 25th of this year that her lawyers had lodged the application, which, which is exactly six months after the, the judgment of the, of the Swiss Federal Tribunal. Um, this will be actually shortened, this, this uh, period from six to four months when Protocol 15 to the European Convention uh, enters into force. 
Um, you know that the, the European Convention has been supplemented with two kinds, two types of protocols, substantial ones, and one of them ha has been mentioned by, by Michel just a few minutes ago, protocol number 12. Um, and there are also procedural, procedural protocols. And the first ones, enter into force when they have been ratified by enough states, three, five, um, how, how, how many you want, and are fixed by the protocol. But procedural ones require a ratification by all states members to, to the European Convention. And as you know, there are 47 members uh, today, and I've checked uh, before our panel today, and protocol 15 has been ratified by 45, 46 states out of 47. The last one is Italy. And as long as Italy has not ratified this protocol, it will not enter into force. When it enters into force, one of its implications will be that the, the, the delay to, to lodge the application will be shorter. Um, then, of course, you have criteria that are not, admissibility criteria that are not presented as such in the convention, and you don't necessarily find them in the text of the convention, but they are, they are there implicitly. For instance, the, the ratione personae criterion, right? Who can lodge an application and against whom? And of course, and it's already been discussed today, but why is Switzerland the state that has to defend the, the world athletics regulations? Well, because um, it's an arbitration process procedure and it comes before the Swiss highest court. But that's interesting um, to note. Then you have the, the, all the classical conditions, uh, rationally temporis, you have to address facts that have taken place after the state have, has ratified the convention. It, it is not an issue here. Rationally lucky, not really either. Rationally materia is interesting. Michel mentioned article eight and 14 of the, of the European convention. Um, of course, it, it would maybe make a difference if Switzerland had ratified protocol number 12, which actually extends the prohibition of discrimination to all the, the legal order, whereas Article 14 requires that the discrimination takes place in the enjoyment of one of the rights guaranteed by the convention. So it, it's more limited than protocol 12. Um, you. You, you probably know that the court is victim of its success and it has been so for, for a long time, which is why, as Antonio mentioned, it takes so much time to, to have a judgment when, when you have one. Uh, last year, I, I've just checked, it received 41,700 applications. Um, and there are 47 judges, of course, uh, one for each member state. So it's a, it's a lot of work to do. What is interesting here, and we're still with the admissibility criteria, is that, and for, for, for lawyers, it's a, it's a very curious admissibility criterion, but it is one that has been thought to, to allow the court to, to deal with its backlog. It's of course the, the, the admissibility criterion that the application must not be manifestly ill-founded. And that is extremely hard to understand because it means that the court will, and it does so very often, declare an application inadmissible because on the substance, it has judged that it was not uh, sufficiently well-founded uh, in order for it to, to, uh, to deserve a real judgment. And this is why, and it, 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 it fluctuates from one year uh, to the next one, but the rate of, admiss of admissibility uh, in, uh, at the European Court is between three and 5% of the applications lodged. So a huge majority of applications never uh, see the, 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 the light of day, so to speak. So the first question, of course, here is whether the court will uh, judge Semania's application as sufficiently well-founded in order to deserve a chamber or a grand chamber uh, judgment, which is which is not uh, assured, although, of course, it's a high profile case. Uh, it raises very important human rights questions. So there is probably a good chance that it reaches uh, the judgment stage, but th there's no way to be entirely sure. Um, you know that the court has different compositions from the single judge 
um, which was also instituted to, to, to gain time and, and to precisely um, take care of all the manifestly ill-founded applications or the ones who, which have been lodged too late, etc. Then you have the committees of three judges, and then you reach the full formations, so to speak, which are the chambers uh, made of seven judges, including always the judge from the member state, uh, which is under uh, consideration in the given case, or the grand chamber, uh, which is the, the highest uh, court within the European court, and which is made up of 17 judges. Um, maybe it's interesting to note that it is possible for a chamber when it thinks that the case that it has to deal with uh, presents so, so vital issues that it, it, it actually requires the grand chamber to immediately deal with it without having a chamber judgment. Um, this uh, relinquishment from a chamber today requires the consent of, of or, or the absence of opposition from the parties, so the applicant and the, the state that has been uh, accused of breaching the European Convention. When Protocol 15 enters into force, this will uh, go away and the chamber will have the liberty alone without asking for the party's consent to relinquish jurisdiction in favor of the Grand Chamber. It is not the only way to, to have the Grand Chamber involved in a case. The other one is after a chamber has issued and has delivered its judgment, one of the parties or both of them actually ask for a, a referral to the Grand Chamber, but it is not an, 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 an automatic one. It has to be um, um, agreed by a panel of five judges. And what is interesting, uh, we mentioned the Mutu and Peshtan case from 2018, as well as the, um, as the, um, um, Oh, it's no, it's a Turkish case. It's the um, it's the Ali Riza versus Turkey case. Both are chamber decision, chamber judgments, and both were asked for referral to the Grand Chamber, and both demands were denied by the five judge panel. So there is not yet a, a big Grand Chamber uh, judgment on cases such as the one from Semania. Uh, I think the next thing we have to we have to look for is whether the court will communicate the case to to Switzerland and to the Swiss government. This will be the first sign that it it actually takes the the, the application seriously and is is uh, willing to go into the substance of the application. You can find it on the on UDAC, the the court uh, um, database uh, system on the internet. And you can see what, when cases are, are communicated. I think I've reached the end of my of my time. Is it is it correct, Antoine? Yes, but you can if, if you want to finish uh, your thought process, you can still. Just 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 two uh, just two two things on, on on the substance. First, of course, here you have the human rights of a private individual that are so to speak threatened by another private individual or entity in this case, but. I mean, it's been, it's been a long time since the European Court has recognized that states have positive obligations. And these positive obligations, of course, require states to take measures to protect individuals' human rights, even from threats that come from private individuals or entities. So I'm not sure the private dimension is necessarily an obstacle to, to uh, the claim that there is some form of discrimination in the case. The second one, the, the, the second point I, I wanted very quickly to make was on, on the margin of appreci appreciation. You know that it will be actually added to the pre preamble of the, of the European Convention when Protocol 15 enters. There's a lot at stake with, with the, the, the Protocol 15's entering into force, but it will be added and it is a sign that the court is, is more and more contested by member states. And, member states criticize it uh, yeah, always always louder and have insisted um, to, to add the, the margin of appreciation, which is to say, let states deal with it more in directly in the preamble of the convention. Now, does it doesn't necessarily mean much because who decides how much margin of appreciation a state gets in a given case, the court, of course, the European court. So, 
I'm not sure it's a, it, it, from a technical point of view, I'm not sure it changes much, but from a symbolical and political point of view, it, it, it shows that the court has to face um, an environment that is, that is getting more difficult and maybe less um, enthusiastic about great uh, jurisprudential developments from Strasbourg. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frédéric. And just on this point, I would, have, I would like to add, to add maybe a comment on my side. I mean, I think the margin of repreciation question in the context of cases involving the Court of Arbitration for Sports, and in particular, the role of the Swiss Federal Tribunal, is a bit of misplaced in a way, because this is a situation in which we're not really talking about the Swiss society. We're talking about Swiss institution acting as world tribunals, uh, acting for the world. So even beyond the European context, uh, regulating globally. And, and in that particular context, I see very little room personally. I, I think there is a good argument to be made that the margin of appreciation should be extremely limited. Um, but now let's turn to, to maybe the questions that, that we have already received. Maybe if I, if I can just add something to this, uh, yeah. the, mar it's, the margin of, of appreciation is a, is, a, is a difficult tool because you never know whether it really guides the European court's results or whether the court reaches it, its result before it, it decides on the, on the actual margin of appreciation. It's very difficult to really find a, a causation link between the margin and the result, and sometimes you wonder whether it's not the other way around. But what is true, and it goes in it, in the same direction as what Antoine just said, is that when it concerns intimate aspects of 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 someone's life, the 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 margin tends to be narrower. So it would go in the same direction. Here we're dealing with someone's body, and treatments that has to, that have to be taken more or less voluntar voluntarily. So this would, this would probably go uh, in, into the small margin of appreciation uh, side rather than wide margin of appreciation. Thank you for the, for the complimentary. I think this, those two comments go together indeed. Um, now picking up on the, on the questions that we have in the chat, um, we have one first question that is directed to Marjolaine. Um, Marjolaine, I don't know if you had the time to already read it and, and make up your mind about it by, by Florian Yellen from, from World Players. Um, yes. The, the union of athletes at the global level. Marjolaine? Yes, well, actually, I was picking up on, on uh, my reference to the, to the letter of the Human Rights Council uh, related experts. I, would, I don't think it's really a question to me. It was more, more follow-up remark and I'm probably not the best person to answer this one. So I'll just uh, present the, what I understand as the, as the question behind it. Uh, so the idea that it should be read in the sense that the sports organizations must you, uh, apply uh, due diligence in human rights. Um, and also, and of course, conduct their scientific research but for me, the question was more about how to consider broader uh, human rights implications, um, including beyond sports. And I think that's, that's maybe something that uh, some of our uh, guests already mentioned, but maybe that we could uh, look into the, the, the and Florian says this was also one of the disappointing parts of the CAS award as a panel failed to take the broader human rights implication into their uh, reasoning, uh, so beyond beyond the context of sports. So, who who would like to uh, to react on this? I think Lena mentioned the the question of the broader implications, or, or Michelle. But um, feel free. Um... Yeah, I can jump in. Um... Um, yeah, I mean, I personally agree. Um, I think the cast explicitly stated that it's not going to look at like um, how the, the DST regulations influence, like I think, social context more broadly. Or the, I think that's what, how it was framed. Um, and I think the SFT could have um, discussed this a bit more. Um, also, I think considering that there is a strong intersex rights movement um, at the international level, there is a strong movement 
to prohibit intersex genital surgeries and hormone treatment forced on children and non-consenting adults. And um, so in, in this way, I think I agree. And I think also following up on what Michelle already said, um, I think uh, the DSD regulations affect not only elite women athletes, but elite women athletes, but also like women more generally and also amateur athletes um, children and it has also a very like discursive power so even though it's now applies only to very few uh, events at the international level it has a very strong like discursive um, power for also national um, sports federations so i think it's the argument that it's only on very like narrow applicability is a bit um, dangerous because I think a lot of like sports federations are thinking about adopting similar rules. Um, so I mean, what World Athletics does and what the cast endorses has broader implications on sports, um, which expand, I think, the elite women athletes competition. I can maybe just add, I mean, I don't necessarily blame the particular panel that was uh, hearing Svenja's case in terms of their sort of refusal to really engage with, uh, you know, the, the reports that were uh, from, from UN bodies and, and uh, others saying, you know, there's a, there's a violation or a potential violation of international or domestic human rights law here. Um, I, I mean, I can see that the, the cast is not exactly set up to do that. So the, the panel wasn't a kind of a, a tricky situation and they made, they sort of used the out that was, well, this won't be for us to decide, this will be for the courts of relevant jurisdictions to decide whether domestic or international human rights law has been violated. So now we are going, I mean, the Swiss Federal Tribunal obviously was limited in what it could actually do in that regard as everyone has nicely explained, but um, I guess that what, that's what will now make the, the European court decision quite interesting because finally there is a court that is specifically sort of tasked with, with taking on this role. And, and then all these, you know, human rights based critiques that are, that are out there from Human Rights Watch, from UN Special Rapporteurs, from the um, Commissioner, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and NGOs, et cetera, will, will kind of have a, not that they will all be directly addressed by, by the court, but they're sort of just floating out there now. And this will be the first time that a, a judicial body will have something to say about it. I, I would like to add something on this point because I, I think also there is a, there's a bit the feeling that, uh, you know, if, if you don't deal with human rights, then this award is not human rights compatible or that because certain organizations are pointing that that a particular regulation is incompatible with human rights, so it is. It is not necessarily the case, and, and the FNASS case is a good prior example in which a lot of unions, for example, were arguing, well, uh, you know, this type of uh, whereabouts rules are totally violating the right to privacy, which in case they are potentially violating, but they then the European Code of Human Rights itself found that they were proportionate. So I, I think here we need to be careful that even if you do human rights due diligence, even if you integrate human rights inside CASA words, and you see it as well with EU law, by the way, which uses the same type of mechanisms in terms of the proportionality analysis, the key question is then a proportionality analysis. You will always be in a position to restrict the right if you have a good reason to do so. And in the present case, I think what is interesting and what is important is that, and, and where the, the key question lies, is that the CAS itself found that it was proportionate, that it was seeking to achieve an, a, a legitimate objective in discriminating against Semenya. And obviously this question will now be hopefully, and I think uh, we don't know yet, uh, re-litigated in a way before the European Code of Human Rights. And what matters is that it's a different body that will answer that same question. But, but having human rights in there doesn't guarantee that the decision will go one way or the other. Um, and now we had a, another question, and I think to some extent, um, 
Frédéric has, has already answered both questions uh, and has anticipated on Kevin Jeremy's question, uh, which was both uh, touching on the issue of the horizontal effect um, uh, and, and was asking whether a previous ECTHR judgment would have less relevance because of the arbitral origin of the claim, uh, plus the lack of link between world athletics and Switzerland. Um, I think that is a, a good question for, for, for Frederick, but I think he, he, to some extent, already answered it. And similarly, with the second question on, on protocol number 12. Uh, Frederick, do, do you want to add something on this? Yes, no, I, I, I think I, I gave some elements, elements of answer to, the, to these questions. Um, I, I'm not sure if, if, I, if I just say a few words on the second one, I'm not sure here it necessarily changes much because I don't think one can deny that the regulations have an effect on Semania's uh right to private life as it derives from article 8 of the of the european convention so you don't have this hurdle of, of article 14 not being independent but requiring to find a basis somewhere else in the convention from a symbolic point of view i i, I think it's a shame that switzerland has not ratified for a call number 12. Uh, and and in the in in the general posture of the states uh, regarding the the topic of discrimination and prohibition of discrimination, I think it's it's difficult to to justify not having ratified it today. But I'm not sure it will be decisive in this case. If I can just say just one more word on the previous question, I think you you were right to to talk about the the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. There are parallels here. We're not talking about business. The, the first ones, of course, that come to mind are mining industries and, and child labor, etc. But we, we actually have the same kind of, of questions, right? Private entities committing some form of human rights violations that we are not very comfortable with because historically human rights have been devised as instruments against the state and not against individuals. And from that point of view, and it, 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 it goes back to what Antoine was saying also a few minutes ago, there's some form of responsibility somewhere um, to, to, to take into account human rights, even if you have private entities. And from that, that point of view, the rugby principles um, co come to mind very quickly, even if we're not really dealing with businesses as such, but foundations and, and, and other, other types of, uh, of, of, of legal entities. And I would say also just to, to what Antoine said a few minutes ago, of course, you, you don't have many absolute rights in the convention. The, the main one is the prohibition of torture uh, that you can, you can never restrict and you can never derogate from. And most of the other ones, including the classical liberties like the right to private life, the right to, to freedom of expression, et cetera, can be restricted by the state. But the state has to make sure it respects the conditions laid out in the convention. And, and that's already something rather than not dealing at all with human rights, making, making sure that, as Michel said, you have a legal basis, you, you follow a legitimate aim, and it is necessary in a democratic society. Thank you. Marjolaine, you want to pick up? Yes, well, I, I first, I, I had some comments, but I'd like to focus on, on the questions uh so that we, we we address the points of the of the audience uh, there is a question uh, bringing in uh, competition law and knowing whether uh, the regulations could also come under attack under the viewpoint of uh, competition law uh, so i don't know whether someone is a uh, uh, or Antoine yourself you want to comment on on this point maybe uh, okay, you're welcome to start you can you can definitely frame a case that would look at the same issue from a competitional perspective. Indeed, you have a regulation that basically excludes a range of athletes from any type of economic opportunity. Whatever the CAS or the Swiss Federal Tribunal say, the alternatives are not really there in terms of competing in a competitive manner on, on other 
types of competition. So I think you could frame it as a, a competitional case. Um, I also think that in the current situation, you will end up with the same type of questions. Uh, uh, the competition law tests that you see based on Mecca Medina would look at, is there a legitimate objective? Is it a proportionate way to attain it? And we would end up with the same type of question, which is to say, well, is this regulation aiming at protecting fairness? And if yes, is it the best way to do so? And is the harm done to Casta Semenya not, uh, or the other athletes that fall under the scope of that competition, not disproportionate to attain that aim? And, and I think um, in that regard, a competition authority would just almost defer to uh, the European Court of Human Rights in that assessment, if it were to do so. There was also a, 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 an interesting question, I think, from, from Ellen Lensky, um, whether the, the European Court of Human Rights um, would consider the scientific critique. So there is a heated scientific debate around uh, the advantages or not of um, athletes like Casta Semenya, um, whether that, would, that debate would be re-litigated in a way um, before, before the European Court of Human Rights. I'm not sure, maybe Frédéric and Michel would like to, to, to jump in on that. Frédéric, you go first. No, I was going to say you, you can go first. <laughs> well, sure. Uh, well, I, I guess I would say, um, well, we don't know, but it's certainly possible. I mean, the court is not set up to, you know, be the a, a court of first instance. So to sort of establish the facts initially or to sort of necessarily reevaluate the facts, but it can. I mean, if the if it can, all the parties that come before it will have to substantiate their claims. So that means they have to bring the evidence. And I, my understanding is that it will be sort of up to the court how much it wants to reassess or reevaluate how much additional evidence it wants to let in. Um, but certainly, I don't think there's anything stopping the court. It just from doing this, it's sort of what it, what it decides is necessary for it to, to make its decision. Frederick, you want to add something? No, no, it's uh, perfect. And and then in this one, I, I will direct to, to you, Frederick, in particular. Um, Jeremy Abel is asking, do you think that there is a possibility that, that the European Court of Human Rights is going to render a decision similar to the one in the Platini case? Um, decisions extensively justified by CAS and SFT, so no violation of the convention. Do you think that could be the way it could go? Yeah, so thank you for the question. It's a, it's a very interesting question. The, the Platini case ended, ended in, a, in an admissibility decision. And this is what I was trying to, to, to uh, mention in my brief remarks, or maybe not so brief remarks earlier um it and i mean it, it it's part of part of the application was was deemed inadmissible because there wasn't uh a real exhaustion of, of, of available domestic remedies because some arguments had not been already brought up before national courts but for the main part you see here the the the, the, the implementation of the of the manifestly ill-founded condition and uh, the problem with this is, and that's possible. I mean, even in the Semania case, you never know. And every formation of the court is, in a, is allowed to issue uh, an admissibility, even the grand chamber, right? Even if a chamber has, has considered the application uh, admissible, has delivered uh, a judgment uh, on the substance of the case and, and the case is referred to the grand chamber it it can still at that at that point decide that in fact the the the, the application was inadmissible the problem with the with, with the with the decision first is that it's final 
So you have no way to bring it or, or to ask for it to be brought before the Grand Chamber. The second weakness of the decision is that you don't know how the judges voted. Of course, you know if it's unanimous or if it's a, if it's a majority decision, but if it's a majority decision, you don't know if it's 6-1, 5-2 or 4-3. So you have no way to know that. And judges do not have the right to uh, write separate opinions. So it's, it's a bit unsatisfying to see substantial, important substantial issues dealt with uh, with a decision because of these weaknesses. Um, and and I, I've told you before, the reason why this admissibility criterion was added was to allow the court to, to deal with its backlog uh, quicker. And when you have, when you have uh, weak applications, uh, it's not too much of a problem to see them uh, take the door because, I mean, through a decision, despite the fact that it's, it's, it's in fact perfectly admissible, but it's manifestly ill-founded. When you have important vital issues dealt with in a decision, it's problematic. Uh, and and the, 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 the best example is the Garodi decision about Holocaust denial, right? Um, in Article 17 of the European Convention and the abuse of right. And the, the, the court needs about, I've forgotten the, the exact number of pages, but like 30 or 40 pages to come to the conclusion that it's manifestly ill-founded. Now, if you need 40 pages to, to, to say that it's manifestly ill-founded, it's clearly not manifestly ill-founded. So yeah, it could be the way the case uh, and Semana's application ends, it, it, it would be a shame because it probably re requires more analysis than that. Yes, I definitely think it would be a shame and it would be a, a public outrage. So I'm not sure whether the judges will dare, but, um, but that would be a, indeed one way to, to end it um, swiftly. Um, I, I think we still have three interesting questions in the chat and, and we're running out of time, but I'm, I'm going to push if, if uh, you have to leave uh, one of you, one of the speakers, uh, please do, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still tempted to, to go uh, beyond the limit. Um, one question to Michelle, and I think it deserves a clarification because I'm not sure that's what you said or what you meant to say. Um, that you said that it will be complicated for the European Court to review the proportionality of a private who, which is not part of national law. Um, and then uh, Pierre refers to Pesht and Mutu, where in the context of false arbitration, the court considered um, the sports governing body rules. I'm not sure what he means by that. In a way, there's, the court considered the, the, the CAS arbitration rules, but, um, but still those are private rules. Um, so, but of a Swiss association, in this case, it's a Monegasque association. But, but maybe you want to precise a little bit what, what you meant. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, let me put it this way. I don't think it's necessarily complicated for, for the court to review um, the, the proportionality or any other you know, aspect of these regulations. But I think Switzerland is going to be in a kind of funny position because it has to identify, you know, what is the legitimate aim, an aim that it did not decide upon itself. This is, you know, it's going to, I, I, it'll be very interesting how this works, you know, is, is Switzerland going to be taking messages from world athletics and putting those before the court? Because these are regulations that, like I said, were not researched and developed and, and supported by the Swiss government. These are, these are regulations made by world athletics, uh, which is, uh, you know, lives in, a, in another country altogether. Um, so I think it will be, yes, yeah, Switzerland will be in a strange position of having to meet all the um, steps in the legal test with, by relying on evidence that was, you know, produced and adduced by world athletics, not by Switzerland itself. So it, I think that's sort of that, yeah, that's what I meant about, about the complication or sort of the strangeness about this case. And in a way, it's right that, and Marjolaine, maybe you want to add to, to that, that it did to some extent that in the Eshtein Mutu case, where it was in a way defending the, the CAS code, which is also a, a private uh, contractual regulation um, of, of, of 
the cast. Um, so I, 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 indeed, that that's a, a, a different setup, for example, than the one that was applying to the FNASS, which uh, in which we were dealing with a French law, French legislation. So, so that would be also interesting to watch. Uh, Merjolaine, do you want to add something? Yeah, so really just to follow up on this and maybe also have uh, Antonio's uh, reaction on this because he mentioned it. Uh, it's true that, for example, in context with the, well, in the context of Article 6 of the CHR, uh, we now have this idea that obviously uh, this applies also to caste proceedings and thus also to dispute resolution that arises from uh, this private uh, sports regulation. But I think it's taking uh, a real additional important qualitative step uh, to say that in terms of substantive rights of the ECHR, uh, Switzerland has a duty to intervene because that's that's a sort of, I mean, I'm, I'm not the specialist of the ECHR, but it's a sort of, if, if it's not a state uh, law, it's a, there is a preliminary idea that you have to have some form of Oblig positive duty of the state to intervene to prevent the infringement from happening. And when you're discussing CAS, where it's the dispute resolution system that leads to the decision of the Swiss Federal Tribunal, so this link can be established. Now, if you have a, a federation that is not based in Switzerland and uh, you have to argue around a positive duty of the Swiss state to intervene for these regulations not to breach uh, in the substantive parts, the substantive guarantees of the ECHR, I think it's an additional qualitative step. But the, the, the follow-up question to Antonio, because this is maybe someone we did something we did not address uh, that much in depth so far, is the, the implication if the if you, as you mentioned, if the ECHR were to uh, ground the application, uh, do you do you think this will have genuine impact on the way the Swiss Federal Tribunal will assess uh, public policy or will adapt it in the context of uh, of sport uh, compared to what it did in this uh, decision with the the personality rights and um, and the Matusalem reasoning about whether the the personality rights were Breach to such extent that there was a breach of public policy, which it denied in Zaminaya's case. Yeah, it's 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 difficult to say, right? Uh, as far as the Swiss Supreme Court, I am is concerned. I, I'm not sure because if you if you look at the way in which um, Eckstein was treated, Article Six is not considered as a ground to set as a breach of Article 6, despite being capable of Switzerland being found guilty in Strasbourg is not a reason to set aside a, an award. You will have on top of that to show that whatever breach of Article 6 uh, you are relying upon is sufficiently, is sufficiently severe to qualify as procedural public policy, if I summarize four pages in, in, in one sentence. So it doesn't show a lot of deference if I can, if I can, uh, if I can summarize. Uh, it's probably more difficult to show less deference in case of substantive guarantees that go you know, to, the, to the very essence of, of, of a person like, it, like in this case. Um, but frankly, to me, that's not the main point. I would like the, the, the cast to take this seriously, right? And I'm sure that, that if we have a decision uh, by the European court uh, saying that those guarantee apply and, and in the proportionality test, you have to, you have to, to, to be serious. And, and probably if you ask me, the, the, the European court will not was not the most serious in that in that uh, examination. If I read the French decision on anti-doping, they said there is a there is a public interest to anti-doping, and it's basically the end of the discussion. Mm -hmm. So, if we are lucky and end up with a decision that it's balanced, where the where the arguments are really discussed, then it can play an important role, not necessarily at the Supreme Court level, but down. Uh, 
down to the, the caste level. If we have a kind of decision like in, like in, uh, uh, in the French case, I'm afraid that this will be even, uh, even worse because it will, be, it will be tempting to say, oh, we have that precedent, there is a fundamental, uh, there is a, a public and private interest to ensure whatever fairness of sport, and then you can always decide what fairness of sport is, and it will be much easier to, to say uh, this argument is not decisive. So it pretty much depends on the quality of the, of the decision and the level of the analysis. Even Pechstein, if you ask me, uh, the level of the, the analysis is, is not great. If it takes nine years and then you forget the main points or you overlook the main points, uh, it, I don't place a lot of, of uh, hope in this decision and I hope to be, I hope to be wrong. But to answer your question, it depends on the level of analysis. Thank you, Antonio. Um, Why are you laughing? No, 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 I, I laugh at your skepticism, which I find healthy to some extent, because indeed there is a lot of hope put, pushed on, on the shoulders of the European Code of Human Rights. And I myself tend to agree a lot with you that uh, both in FNAS and in Pechstein and Hutu, uh, the reasoning was kind of really weak and not extremely comprehensive, nor really going at the heart of the matter, in particular in Pechstein, where I would distinguish between the judgment and uh, the dissenting opinion. Um, so I, I think you're right. And in a way, it has a bit of a counterintuitive feel that I, I think is important to, to, um, to have uh, put out there here. Um, and, and now we still have two questions, um, one by, by uh, PJ, um, which, who is mentioning a number of, of testimonies regarding human rights violation of women athletes that were presented after the CAS hearing. And here, maybe a question that is best directed at Frédéric. Um, my intuition, but I'm again not an expert in, in, in terms of procedural matter before the European Code of Human Rights, is that you could still present evidence that has not been presented uh, before the CAS or before the Swiss Federal Tribunal, but I'm not sure about that. So, so what, what, is, uh, what is your point of view? No, I, I guess I would distinguish be between what belongs to the facts and what belongs to somehow um, international reports or international uh, by NGOs, for instance, the, the court, the European court quite, it, it's part of its, of its vision so far that the, the convention has to be interpreted in a, in a dynamic way, <clears throat> usually looks at what's happening elsewhere. Within the Council of Europe, of course, when you have recommendations, for instance, but also at the UN level, and if you have, and even, even NGOs, and it sometimes supplements the facts um by by of the case by uh, using by importing into into the judgment uh, elements once again derived from uh, special reporters or reports or uh, or ngos but I, i'm not sure to what extent um it, it would be in a position to entirely base a judgment on evidence that has been presented after the the, the decision that is that is under review if I can take the, the next question too, I think you'll have to wait a, a couple of years <laughs> at least. So it will, be, it will be very long. And it's, as Antonio said at the beginning, it's, it's I mean, sometimes it's, it's, the, it's the strength of the European court, right? If you're dealing, for instance, with uh, terrorism cases, it, it, it has some value for the court to intervene after four or five years because minds will have uh, cooled down and things will have hopefully gone back to normal and the court will be in a position to you know address the heart of the matter and do this bravely here it's it's more difficult to to see value because of course semania won't i mean time time will have an impact on on her career so but i, I think you'll have to wait even platini took i think three years for a, for an inadmissibility decision so it's a it, it takes it takes a lot of time 
So you have to be patient. Yes, and Emilia doesn't have that time, I guess, but uh, that is another issue with, with uh, European Code of Human Rights. It's only Claudio Pechstein, Claudio Pechstein who could continue to skate up until 50 something. Um, well, uh, maybe that, a, a that, that, that being said, it's a good sign if it takes time because it means the court is taking the application seriously. You don't want to have a, a, an answer too too quickly because it means you you will receive a one judge letter saying that the, the application is unadmissible. So it, it's not a good it's not a good news for for Semania. But if it takes time, it means that it's being it's being taken seriously. Sorry to have interrupted you, Antoine. No, no problem. I was going to give the floor uh, again to to Lena. And, uh, and to Michel for maybe a few closing statements, especially Nina, which we haven't heard that much from. So I would like to, to make sure that you, you get still to, to share with us your point of view. Yeah, no, I was happy also to listen to your views. Um, maybe one thing I, I wanted to point out, I think it's, it's smart to be a bit skeptical about, about the process at the European Court of Human Rights. But I think what is interesting and important to see is that there are more cases coming related to sports and human rights to the court. And I think in the long run, this will also pose a bit of a question about the Swiss legal system, because at the moment there is this legal gap that um, European, um, the European Convention on Human Rights does not directly apply to this notion of public policy. So, but at the same time, then Swiss can be, Switzerland can be held accountable for validating um, CAS awards. So there's, there, there is kind of like a legal gap. And I think if there will be more and more cases, I think it would be also um, up to the Swiss Federal Tribunal to reconsider maybe its definition of pub public policy in itself in order to avoid being in front of the Court of um, Human Rights one more time. So it's I think it's, it's encouraging to see um, that there's more of a discussion in the interplay on sports and, and human rights. Thank you. Michelle, would you like to, to add something? Maybe I'll just mention one sort of concern that, that I have, and we'll see how far it comes to uh, fruition or not. But um, I think there's sort of a, a, a real risk here that the, the ECHR will, will frame this case similarly to how the, the, the CAS and the SFT did as you know, a, a conflict of rights. And I'm just not sure if that is the you know, an accurate or productive approach to sort of pit women against each other. Uh, I suspect Lena has some thoughts on this as well, but but I think it is, you know, a real risk because others who who know the ECHR gender discrimination jurisprudence much better than me, you know, have, have noted that the court generally interprets um, sort of equality rather formalistically, um, you know, focused on equal treatment rather than say, um, whether there's like a perpetuation of um, marginalization of an already marginalized group or, or um, and especially has a hard time sort of dealing with intersectional discrimination, which is something we see here. So this is where I'm, um, yeah, I do have some concerns about how the, the court will, will deal with this, but then again, discrimination is not the only issue here. So I, I'm hopeful because there are other human rights that, 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 are, that are at issue and that will be considered. Thank you. Um, I think, Marjolaine, do you want to, to add something before, before we close? No, I will let you close, but I just like to uh, thank everyone warmly for uh, being here. I think it was very interesting for me and uh, I suppose also for the audience was in great majority uh, stick with us until now. So um, I will let you uh, finish, but thanks to everyone. And have a good evening and good Easter, if there is any such thing as Easter still <laughs> these days in the in these pandemic days. But um, I'll let you close. Thanks. Well, to I everyone. don't have that much to add to uh, to your thank you. Uh, I think uh, I would like to thank indeed the audience and and our speakers for for a very interesting discussion. Again, this discussion uh, will be available uh, via our YouTube channel. Um, if you want to, to share it, please do. Um, and, and we will be back. Uh, we don't know yet whether it will be in April or in May uh, with, a, with a new edition. Of, of course of, it will be in April. It has of to. It will be in April. Um, with a new edition of our Zoom in webinar. So thank you very much to, to all of you and, and we hope to, to see you soon. <laughs>